Hi, today we're talking to Jennifer Wolf. Jennifer Wolf is the CEO, no, I'm sorry, she is the creator of figurativewriting.com and the Children's Creative Writing Institute. But before we get to those two austere um, organizations, let's talk about you and how you got started. Now, you and I met years ago when we were both working in the film industry. Uh, but before that, you moved out here from where? Baltimore. Baltimore. So uh, Baltimore by way of Rochester. I studied political science and creative writing at the University of Rochester, which I loved. It's an amazing place, but it's really, really cold. It starts snowing in September and it doesn't stop until April. So I packed two suitcases after I graduated and said, I'm going to California. And wow. And so was it just the cold? Yeah, it was just the cold. It's really a great place and a great city, but I was really, really cold. Now, why Rochester from Baltimore? I happened to visit on the one nice day they had during the year. It was sometime <laughs> in April, and it was beautiful. It was absolutely beautiful. And it was a great place. I don't regret it for a second. And you got your degree there? Yes. Okay. In political science and creative writing, and then out to California. And then what happened when you got to Sunny Cal? Uh, when I got to California, I got a job as a production assistant on the Twilight Zone TV show, which was a lot of fun. I was on a lot. And then six weeks later, I was driving to work and heard on the radio that the show was canceled. So that was my great introduction to Hollywood. I mean, that's how you found out? Yeah, that's how, that's how we all found out. Oh my God, you mean the whole production office had no idea? Yeah, yeah I mean, we knew we were in trouble. We knew it wasn't good. But we didn't, we, we didn't know the show was going to get canceled that quickly. Oh, my God. Talk about baptism by fire. Yeah. And then ended up at Freeze Entertainment, where I met you. Right, right. Our uh, fabulous Freeze days that we, we all remember. It's kind of funny that uh, I talk to people, you know, uh, there are times in their lives when they come across, like, core teams that just for some reason really clicked well and really worked together. And it's like, you know, since Freeze, I worked as a project manager at, uh, at Honda and at Toyota. And there was like a core team at both those places that where we just still get together once, you know, once a year even, because, you know, it's been some time since we've been there. And um, Freeze was that place for me. It just clicked. We definitely had a group that clicked. Yeah. I mean, the fact that I met my wife there has absolutely nothing to do with it. <laughs> but yes, I mean, I really enjoyed it. And so there, what were you doing? I was reading scripts, uh, looking for TV movies. And? So uh, we found a few. Um, but I learned a lot. You really learn a lot when you read piles and piles of scripts. You see things you like, things you don't like. When you came out here to California, I mean, was it with the design of getting into screenwriting? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. But when you were in college, you weren't studying screenwriting or were you? I was studying creative writing. I okay. Political science, which I just liked. I wanted to study something I liked in college. And then creative writing, which I knew I wanted to pursue. Okay. And so as a reader... Did you feel that you had any, I don't know, um, insight into the story, into what, what, what would make a good TV movie? Sure, absolutely. You know, you, you, and you know, even if you don't know the terminology, anybody can read a script and know if the characters are compelling, if the plot moves, if it's interesting. You might not know, if you don't have the background, you might not know why it works or why it doesn't work. But you can still get a pretty good idea, I think. Okay. And uh, from there, did you write any spec scripts? I did. I even had one option or two option, but nothing was ever made. Okay. Talk to me, talk to me about the optioning process. Well, a producer will just uh, call and say, hey, I'd like to option the screenplay. And then they give you, you give them a certain amount of time either a year or two years to get it set up and then you have everything else worked out in the contract 
and they go off and try to get it set up. And it must, I mean, how involved do you get in that process when the producer is trying to set it up? I do you always, or do they, the producer, keep you at arm's length during that process and say, hey, thank you for this. Thank you for letting me have your work. We'll call you when something happens. Or is there a way that you can be more actively involved? I think it really depends on the producer. It depends on the writer. Uh, I think now I would want to be more involved. At the time, no. I didn't really know that many people in California or Los Angeles. I didn't know that many people in the film business. I think now it would be a little bit easier for me. Yeah. I've gone in a different direction and my, you know, my focus has changed. Right. So um, what happened after Freeze? What happened after Freeze? Let's see. I kept writing. I got married. I had kids. And I set up my tutoring business. But, uh, I mean, you kept writing through your, I mean, your, your kids' youth, right? I mean, you didn't just stop well, writing and then when they were out of the house, then I'm back to writing. And I'm, and I'm still writing. I'm still working on some articles. I, I'm, not, I'm always writing. And did you get uh, articles? Were you doing some nonfiction stuff when you first started? Mm -hmm. What kind of stuff was that? Uh, some automotive writing. Automotive? Uh, automotive. I have a thing for cars. So, in fact, one of my in between jobs was selling cars. That's so, amazing. I, um, you know, the California, the whole California freeway system to someone who's from Baltimore is fascinating. It's a little bit clogged today, but. It's still fascinating. So I like writing about cars. So, I mean, do you, when you write about cars, are you, I mean, are you a, like a technical writer about cars and talking about, you know, torque versus, uh, I, I don't a know. Little, a little bit, the torque, the suspension system, but also how it feels, how it handles, how it rides. So you're reviewing cars too. <laughs> oh man, that's impressive. Um, okay, so uh, what about story editing? Were you, did you do any story editing? I did not do that much story editing. I more found the script and then passed it along. Okay, so that was your time at Freeze. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. So then tell me about what you're doing now, the um, Children's Creative Writing Institute. So now I'm focused on helping the next generation learn how to write because I really feel that Writing is the critical skill for the 21st century. All of, most of our communication is in writing. Your first impression is in writing. So I started tutoring elementary school kids, and then I wanted to create something a little bit bigger that would allow me to reach more than just one-on-one. -on -one. So I created the Children's Creative Writing Institute and worked on teaching kids how to come up with characters, how to write stories. Um, and from there, I realized that kids really are missing out on more of the fundamentals of writing. There have been so many cutbacks in education. Classes are so overcrowded. Teachers are so pressured to teach to the test that they really don't have a lot of time to teach fundamental writing skills. So I thought about how to make writing fun and I came up with figurativewriting.com, which teaches figurative language. Okay, so the I, I've got so many follow-up questions, it's crazy, but the <laughs> first one is- I really threw a lot out at you. Yeah, the, the first question I have then would be, what is figurative writing? Okay, figurative language is what makes writing fun. It's hyperboles and similes, onomatopoeia, personification. It's all those things that we might use in our everyday speech, but we don't really think about it. We don't really give a name to it. It just, it makes, basically it makes writing really fun. Hyperbole is really big exaggeration. So even a kid who doesn't like to write, when I explain what hyperbole is and, you know, turn this into an exaggeration. The, the dog was tall, that was a tall dog. And they'll come up with all sorts of crazy things. I mean, that was a dog that rivaled the Empire State Building, something like that. <laughs> exactly, it's fun. 
So how old are the kids? I took her kindergarten through sixth grade. And I mean, do they, they, do they really spark to this? Yeah, they really do. You look very surprised. I know, I am surprised because you think about the society that we live in and especially what children are being taught in terms of, of the written word. Mm -hmm. 90, I mean, I would think their first written word is texting and that's not even complete sentences. You know, that's just shorthand. Um, emails, which isn't much better. Uh, so I'm kind of surprised that kids are interested in this. I will tell you that grammar is a tougher sell. You know, if I try to teach where do you put the comma, that's a lot less interesting to most kids than come up with an onomatopoeia. Well, but I mean, it's I, it, it definitely sparks some creativity. Do you think one of my questions, and I'll circle back to my uh, yet another question, but do you think that creativity is something that is innate or do you think it's something that's learned? I think it's innate. I think we are all creative. Um, I think that as adults, we tend to, oh, you know, we tend to judge ourselves. We're so busy. You know, we're a lot less creative because of other pressures. I, but I think that it's definitely something that is innate and every human on the planet has a creative element to them. So um, as, as kids get older, when do you think that starts happening where there are outside pressures that start to suppress that creativity? I think by middle school, they start to censor themselves. I think the elementary school kids are 100% creative. But I, I think definitely by middle school, when they're overwhelmed with homework, peer pressure, it definitely gets a lot hard, harder to hold on to that. And this is the this is on top of like just the external teaching that they get from people who say, look, you just can't say anything that pops into your head. Exactly. When, as a writer, you want to write down anything that pops into your head. That's why journaling is so important. I think that if kids have journals, they're not worried about what anybody is going to think. They're just sort of free to experiment. I think uh, journals definitely go a long way towards creating good writers. And that's something you teach? No, it's something I encourage. I think it should be private. I don't think anybody really needs to be taught how to journal. It's a place where kids aren't, or anybody, you're not judged for what you write. You're able to just create or express your feelings or do whatever you want. It's your private journal. There's no rules. You just have to sit down and do it. That's the only, that's the only rule. And do you have a journal? I do have a journal. And you, I mean, do you keep it up to date? You know, I, I don't do it every day, maybe a couple times a week. Oh, I mean, that's better than 99% of the people out there. You think so? Yeah, I think, you know, I think we all had journals, you know, when we were kids, especially, you know, when we were going through those awkward teenage years and we we're full of angst over, you know, whether or not we we're going to make the team or whether the girl likes us and all of that. But I think it kind of fell to the wayside when the girl did like us or we made the team and we no longer had to, you know, get that angst out. Well, honestly, I had actually stopped journaling. And then last summer I did a fellowship at Cal State L.A. for teachers of writing, for the writing project that's housed at Cal State L.A. And every morning from about 9 to 9.30, we would journal. That's how we started the day. And it was fantastic. Do you think journaling is the same as free writing? Mm hmm It can be. So I mean, can you, would you make a distinction between the two? Um, yeah, absolutely. I think um, journaling, we th when we think of journaling, we think more about writing your feelings, writing about what's going on, whereas free writing is more like, hey, look, there's a squirrel, there's a butterfly, whatever pops into your head. But a lot of times when we sit down to journal, we don't have anything specific to write about. So we can start out free writing and then one thing can lead to another. And you can even start out writing blah, blah, blah. And then eventually you'll move on from there and something decent will come out. Um, that's probably good advice for any writer out there. I mean, I know that um, 
uh, I can't think of her name, but the woman who wrote uh, the cre- um, oh, yeah, the Mind's Eye. Oh, I can't even think of the name of the book. Writing on the Left Side of the Brain, that book. She oh. she encouraged uh, people to journal or free write in the morning before they got started to actually work on their writing. And that, uh, you know, that that first draft is always going to be almost like free writing because you just don't necessarily want to censor anything. It's the rewriting process that goes back and cleans it up. So I can certainly see that as an amazing and a a good idea for most people. Interesting enough, something else uh, which I think would apply to the children too, uh, coloring. It's like when you color something, you're given a blank you know, black and whites with lines to, to color within or without, um, it, it like makes you more left brain. And as a result, it kind of frees up that creativity. Have you heard that? I have. And I, I think that that's true. I have a lot of worksheets, like particularly character and plot or character and setting worksheets where I'll have the bottom half of the page is lined for writing and the top half is open for coloring. Yeah, it is important and it does. Sometimes kids will want to color first and then write and sometimes they'll write first and then color and either way is good. That's interesting. And what about, um, you know, it, it when you talk about character and you talked about uh, setting, are you also teaching structure? Of course, <laughs> of course. But, you know, these are difficult concepts for kids. Yeah, that's... So I'll, you know, I, I'll start out with beginning, middle and end. Um, And then we'll go from there and I'll have um, graphic organizers that take it a little bit further and show them how to escalate the problem. So the beginning and the middle, you have the problem and it gets worse and worse and worse. And that's always a lot of fun to teach because they really have to be creative about how to make the problem worse. And sometimes I'll get all sorts of wacky stuff. Yeah. But it's really it's really a lot of fun to watch them stretch because, you know, okay, I came up with the problem. Okay, I solved it. Well, no, you got to make the problem worse. Yeah, because they solved it too quickly. Right. Right. Um, what about grammar? Because you say that that's like a tougher sell. Is it because they're so young or is it just the English language is just a crazy, crazy thing to try and understand? The English language is crazy, but it could also be my own personal preference. I would rather make up characters than worry about semicolons. I mean, it's a little bit like eating vegetables to me, but you know, obviously it's very important. So what I'll do is I'll start out with a little warm up activity and then I'll do a maybe a one page worksheet on where you put the quotation marks and I'll just sort of sneak it in there. But yeah, it's you need grammar. It's very important. Well, I mean, I mean, something that's as basic as a quotation mark. Uh, but you know, as kids get older, I would imagine, uh, and and this writing sort of takes off from just a you know a fun class exercise to something that's hey, you know, I've got a really good idea for a story. Somehow or somewhere, it has to in inhabit their work. Mm-hmm. So um, I always feel that. That's something, I mean, because my grammar is so atrocious at, at this age that the fundamentals were never really covered when I was a kid. You know, I think schools are doing a pretty good job of covering the fundamentals of grammar. Start the sentence with a capital letter, put a period at the end, but they don't really go much further than that. I think I think you're right. I think that We do need to focus more on it. I mean, actually should probably focus more on it when I tutor, but I'm really, my thing is to make sure that it's fun and engaging and I do sprinkle a little bit in, but I I should actually think about adding a little bit more. Well, um, to that, to that extent, um, how long have you been doing this? I've been doing this, uh, let's see, this is uh, 2017, for about seven years. So uh, have you met any um, sixth graders Mm -hmm. 
seven years ago who are now, you know, 18 or 19 and are still writing? Um, you know, I'm sure they're still writing, but I think a lot of them have kind of moved on to whatever they're studying in college, whether it's engineering or pre-med or whatever it is. So you don't have uh, any famous authors that uh, you started in your, your tutorial program not, yet? Not yet. I'm still hopeful, though. Okay. Just just wanted to see. What about your kids? Are they uh, Are they into the creative side at all? They are. They are very creative. So my oldest had a musical, one act musical, that was just that she wrote, she produced, she directed it, she wrote the music, the lyrics, the music, everything. And that was a piano fight in San Francisco. Wow. So that was, that was really fun. That's amazing. And so, yeah, and she did it all herself, which means she'll really fit into Hollywood well. Yeah. Yeah, she got a grant from the music department at Berkeley, and she took the money and and ran with it. Did did she credit you at all? You know, I want to thank my mom for <laughs> this. You know, creative. There's just a lot of people to credit. She, she did a good job. That's fantastic. So, um, I guess with creating and and working on creativity with kids. What do you think that we as adults can do to kind of foster that without being, I don't know, I don't want to say permissible, but, you know, without being, you know, crazy, without putting any structure into a child's life? I think encouragement. I, I think encouragement is the most important thing. If you, we encourage them to read, we encourage them to write and not being judgmental. You don't want to stand over them and say, you know, you need the comma here or what have, you know, what's wrong with that? Why is that character named whatever? Or why did that character use a cuss word? Just let them, let them write. Let them have time to experiment. Now, I, maybe I'm, I probably didn't really focus the question correctly then. I'm thinking that, you know, as kids get older, uh -huh. you know, society, parents, teachers, you know, uh, enforce uh, more and more structure into a child's life. You know, the, those when we were in kindergarten and first grade, I mean, our big thing was, you know, recess, and then we'd come back in and we'd still be playing in the classroom, you know, and maybe we'd get a, open up a book and read about, you know, C-Spot Run and all that. But as we got older, more and more, we were more and more um, pigeonholed. I don't know if that's the correct word, but we were we were put into a stronger structured um, way of doing things from, you know, the classroom, from having to say the Pledge of Allegiance to when the bell rings, we change classes. We have, you know, a couple minutes between classes and things like that. Do you think that that, that process of just, of just growing up and just getting older and just having more structure in your life, do you think that that crushes creativity? I think it crushes it. I think that it crowds it out. I, th I think that the kids still have a lot of creativity. They just don't have the time to pursue it. So, so it would be nice if they had more time. Do you teach, you know, uh, do you teach in terms of just working with the kids? Do you teach that there is a, a writing time and then now writing time is over and there's time to do something else? Not really. I, I sort of go with whatever the situation I'm presented with is. So a lot of times when I'm tutoring, I'm, I'm really needed to sort of supplement the work that's going on in school. So there isn't that much time for creativity. Over the summer, when I tutor, I, I emphasize it particularly over the summer. That's the time to let these kids just be creative and go with it. But, it, you know, it's a fair criticism, I think, that they don't have enough time to be creative during the school year. And I, I wish they did. Uh, it's just, it's this dichotomy between, you know, let's be creative and let's play and let's, you know, let's get something on the page. And then also let's be disciplined. And let's say that, uh, you know, as an adult, uh, I know that I have my writing time, you know, that, you know, no matter what I'm doing, I, you know, my butt needs to be in this chair at a certain time and I need to be writing as opposed to anything else. 
And that's only, I guess, because I'm down in a professional path and I work as a professional writer. Uh, kids obviously aren't going to be professionals. And I guess you're not, well, I, I don't know. It feels to me like you're training the future writers of America and that, uh, and that you know, we're going to see great things from these kids who started learning this, you know, in, at that very, very young age. I hope so. I really hope so. I mean, I, I think that it encourages them to go down a path of creativity. And whether it's writing or entrepreneurship, whatever it is, just understanding that they are creative and they can trust their own creativity. I, I think that that's the biggest thing I want these kids to take away. And what about their parents? Are you training their parents as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm training their parents on how to allow them to be creative. And do you get any pushback from parents at all? Um, I don't get a lot of pushback. Sometimes if I'm, you know, a kid wants to come up with a character that's like the moon is made out of poop or, you know, whatever it is, it's fine with me. As long as they're writing, as long as they're being creative, poop can play into it as much as they want. Why a not? Lot, a lot, right. Poop is funny. Farting is funny. If they want to write a story where it's all about farting, that's okay with me as long as it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. It is funny, especially in this house, but go ahead. <laughs> so at first, you know, the parents are sort of uptight about it, and then I have to encourage the parents to relax and let the kids just go with it. Okay. And are you doing this one-on-one -on -one or are you doing this in groups or both? Well, actually both. I do a fair amount of one-on-one. -on -one. I also teach at Cal State LA through the writing project. And what so, is that? The writing project is um, a subsidiary of the National Writing Project. They have site to 200 colleges and universities and they we basically train the teachers on how to train the teachers of the teachers, the student teachers, and the students. So we really hit every level along the food chain and when it comes to writing. That's fantastic. That, I, I'm totally impressed by that. You know, I got to say that I wouldn't have the patience for it. Of course, I wouldn't have the, you know... I, You've raised two beautiful daughters, and obviously you've had to develop patience, whether you, you had it or not. I, you know what? I naturally have a lot of patience. I don't know why. I just am a patient person. It's just nothing gets to you. It takes a lot. When it gets to me, it gets to me. But on a regular basis, I, yeah, I can just roll with it. So, so don't get to that breaking point. Right. Yet. I try really hard not to get to that breaking point. <laughs> Well, this has been fantastic. I really appreciate the time you've spent with us. Uh, tell us where people can reach out and learn more about you and about your... Well, two places. You can go to figurativewriting.com to learn all about figurative writing. Uh, there's a lot of free worksheets, a lot of free information, plus a workbook that's for sale, which will we'll make a discount, a coupon code for your listeners. Oh, fantastic. And then you can also go to the Children's Creative Writing Institute, which is ccwi.net, ccwi.net. Okay. And uh, those two websites. So whatever your writing needs are, I think we should be able to handle them there. Okay. And if people want to reach you directly? Oh, uh, you can also find me on Instagram. Forgot about that. Oh. So I'm figurative writing on Instagram. And on Facebook, I am the Children's Creative Writing Institute. Okay. So you can just um, hit me up on Facebook. That's probably the easiest under Children's Creative Writing Institute um, or, or Instagram. So either one is good. Okay. That's fantastic. Thanks, Jen. You have been absolutely great. Well, thanks to you. I'm really impressed with you. I'm so happy with your, that your books are out. It's been really fun reading them, watching you get them out there. Oh, thanks. Bye. Bye.